Today, Nick and I are just outside of Palm Springs taking a look at Mazda's newest entry into the two-row SUV segment, the CX-70. But this CX-70 has a lot of similarities to the CX-90, and depending on how you ask, there are pros and cons both direction. The real question is, does it differentiate itself enough to be worth considering on its own? And today, we're gonna find out. I'll go ahead and grab the camera as we take a walk around. Nick, go ahead and tell us about what's going on in the front end. Yeah, so with us today, we have the plug-in hybrid variant of the CX-70, and this is the Premium Plus. So you're gonna find nice gloss black accents throughout the vehicle, and starting in the front, we have this nice honeycomb grill. Inside the honeycomb grill, we do have parking sensors as well as the radar for the radar cruise control integrated. You can see that our DRLs do kind of swoop into this honeycomb grill, part of the nice design of these headlights that are LED as standard on all CX-70s. Now down below in the black accents of the vehicle, we do have parking sensors, which is nice where if you do have to replace those, they do not have to be paint color matched. Now the premium plus of the plug-in hybrid does have a silver lower bumper in the front as well as in the rear. Now coming around to the side, it looks like we have a nice set of wheels. How many wheel options do we get? Yeah, so for the plug-in hybrid, we only get the 21-inch option. So we do have a machine-faced black aluminum wheel with a 275-45 tire um, for the plug-in hybrid. Now, it does come with 19s on the very base model for the 3.3 turbo, but quickly it goes to a 21, and throughout the lineup, you have 21-inch aluminum wheels. And you said that's a 275 on that smaller 19-inch wheel for the preferred entry-level trim. That's also a 265, so pretty wide tires across the whole line. Yep, exactly. And then setting itself apart from the other vehicles, we do have a PHEV badge right here on the side. Now, on the 3.3 Turbo and Turbo S, this will be indicated with an inline-six badge as it does have a new 3.3 liter inline six that Travis will talk about here in just a little bit. Now setting itself apart from the Bigger Brother CX-90, we do have plastic cladding or trim that runs from the front all the way to the black of the vehicle, giving it a little bit of a sportier look. Now making this a premium feel, LED integrated side mirrors with piano black, mirror caps, roof rails that have a load rating of over 500 pounds according to Mazda, so you can put a rooftop tent if you wanna get out and adventure. We have piano black door handles, B pillar, C pillar, also a rear spoiler here so now we do it i say now we do have enough ground clearance here to get yeah. just about anywhere you would need to go without a full off-roader yep. and that's exactly what we did we went and had a head and found a trail and we got here pretty easily right yep so we have eight inches of ground clearance to get you to wherever you want to be now granted you do have 21 inch wheels with very little sidewall so you really have to find a balance of that but if you do find yourself trying to get to a hiking trail or just maybe like a little fishing hole you can do that. You can load up the back with all of its storage. You can find any trail you want to go onto within reason, and that eight inches of ground clearance will get you there. Now you can see that we went ahead and went off the road to get here. We've got a little bit of dust here on the back, but tell us about the rear end of the CX-70. Yeah, so you're going to see that this is very similar to its big brother, the CX-90. Same design features, and over here on the driver's side, CX-70 indication, standard all-wheel drive throughout the trim levels and all the vehicles. And then the thing that sets it apart from the other vehicles is the e-Skyactiv plug-in hybrid electric vehicle badge that is on the passenger side of the vehicle. LED taillights come standard. We have the rear wiper, obviously. Third brake light up here in this gloss black spoiler. Down below, you're gonna see that we do not have any exhaust tips protruding from the lower rear bumper, and that is because they are tucked underneath. We do have a twin tip exhaust, but that is gonna be tucked under for a nice clean look. Now you're gonna see that we do not have a trailer hitch on this. That is an accessory that you can purchase from the dealer. Now the plug-in hybrid, you can tow up to 3,500 pounds, but for the 3.3 turbo and the turbo S, you can tow up to 5,000 pounds when optioned correctly. Now the base model is limited to 3,500, just like this vehicle, but 5,000 is the max tow capacity for the CX-70. Now the CX-70 is definitely one of the longer entries in the two row SUV segment, but there's gotta be a benefit somewhere, right Nick? Yeah, so the, at over 200 inches in total length, it's pretty long compared to one of its competitors, the Grand Cherokee. It's about eight inches longer in length, but it does translate to more interior storage. So if you go ahead and pop open this automatic lift gate, that opens up. You can see that we can fit two carry-on bags end-to-end -end with no problem in space, as well as some space off to the side. Yeah, it's definitely one of the longer cargo areas, but not necessarily as square, but it's got to be because of the overall shape, right? It's got a more athletic stance. Right, yeah. The Mazda kind of wants a more sporty look to their two-row SUV, so they have that sloped roof, which translates to a lower roof line and Al cubic feet is measured, the height comes into play. So it is not the most storage out of the two-row SUV segment, but it does have a lot of depth to the rear cargo area, which 
there is a problem with that and I'll talk about that here in just a second, Travis. So let's go ahead and pull these out. We can show that there is a little bit more storage underneath this rear floor. Now, rear storage is at 40 cubic feet. Underneath, we have some more storage. We have our charging cable here off to the left, some tools off to the right as well as a user manual. Pop that open, we have more storage with this nice little foam insert. And now we're kind of getting into the space where I'm gonna talk about the issue with how deep this rear cargo area is. I'm six foot, I have long arms and long legs. If you are a shorter person, this may run into an issue. Travis is also a large fella, so we don't have any problem getting into this rear cargo area, but if you're short, this little cargo area here is gonna be tough. So that is something to take note of. It I'm thinking that's mostly for emergency snacks. They're there yeah. if you need them, but if you need to reach it in quick order, you'd probably wanna put yeah. it closer. Yeah, you need to work for it. Now with the floor folded back down, you can see the total depth of this rear cargo area behind that second row, which is 40 cubic feet. If we go ahead and press this button, automatically folds those seats down nearly flat, and that gets you 75 cubic feet, or nearly 75 cubic feet of total storage with those seats folded down. Here in the front seat of this Premium Plus plug-in hybrid variant, we do get an eight-way power adjustable seat with two-way lumbar support. Unfortunately, none of the CX-70s are going to come with four-way lumbar, but the seat itself is pretty comfortable, and I was able to find a good comfortable position, and I do have the seat all the way down. There is still a few inches of headroom plenty of headroom, even with the sunroof, for anyone who wants to sit just a little bit higher. The one downside here for the top end of the plug-in hybrid is that we still have a tilt and telescoping manual steering wheel. It's only in the 3.3 liter Turbo S that you can actually get this power adjustment, but we do still have two-way memory seating. Moving to the rear seat, I have the front seat set to my comfortable driving position, and I do still have quite a bit of leg room, but I don't have the longest legs in the world, so it's not terribly surprising that I get pretty good leg room with this seat in this position. We'll check out the other seat a little bit later. What I do have is a fairly upright seating position, and that's because this is a multi-stage recline, and this is the most upright. With the most upright, I do still have about an inch or so of headroom. If I slide over to the passenger seat, that seat is set all the way back. So the exact opposite of extra leg room. And I still have about two to three inches set aside for myself here. And we do have a center armrest with two additional cup holders. So no matter how big or small you may be, you should find a pretty good comfortable position here in the rear seats. One more feature of these rear seats that is a little bit unusual is that we have the ability to slide them forward. And that's because this was conceived as a three row vehicle. Now it's not something you're gonna do every day, but if you do have a larger item, this is gonna give us about eight to 10 more inches of clearance. So we could fit a slightly larger item in there. And again, if you're not gonna be one to use it, then don't worry, just leave it slid all the way back. Under the hood, we're gonna find two different engine layouts, but three different powertrain variants. And we'll start here with what we have under the hood, which is the 2.5 liter inline four cylinder mated to the pretty powerful electric motor that makes up the plug-in hybrid system. That total output is going to be 323 horsepower with 369 pound-feet of torque with the electric motor providing just about a third of that total power output. Now you'll be able to get just about 25 miles of electric driving range on the just under 18 kilowatt hour battery but once that's depleted you're looking at about 25 miles per gallon. The other engine, you may have noticed there was a little bit of room here, is an inline six cylinder turbo 3.3 liter. And that's gonna be split up into a higher and lower power output. The lower output is rated on regular gasoline and that's gonna be 280 horsepower with 332 pound feet of torque. If you bump up to the higher output, which is rated to run on premium fuel, you're looking at 340 horsepower and a total of 369 pound-feet of torque, which does match what we find in the plug-in hybrid. Both of those inline six cylinders carry a lot of the same parts and a lot of the differentiation comes down to tuning. But if you do get the higher output and you run it with regular fuel instead of premium, you'll still get a higher rated output than you find in the regular output on regular fuel. Now let's talk about pricing and how these trim levels are laid out for each vehicle. So starting out, we have the 3.3 turbo which is one of the two inline six variants. And that has three trims to choose from, preferred, premium, and premium plus. For the bottom end, the base trim, it's gonna be $40,445 for that preferred. Jumping to the premium, it's a whopping $5,500 more. 
which is $45,900. Then the Premium Plus is a $48,900 price tag. Now you go to the 3.3 Turbo S, which is the higher output of the two inline six variants, and that has two trim levels to choose from. $52,450 for that premium, and then the Premium Plus is $55,950. Now we have the plug-in hybrid like we have here that has two trim levels to choose from. We have a premium and premium plus, $54,400 to get into a plug-in hybrid. And then like we have here, $57,450. So the plug-in hybrid is quite a bit more expensive than a 3.3 turbo or the turbo S. So you're gonna have to find uh, kind of a middle ground and see if it's really worth the extra cost for your plug-in hybrid variant of the CX-70. Even though the plug-in hybrid is the most expensive trim or the most expensive vehicle in the CX-70 lineup, you get some features in the Premium Plus Turbo S that you do not in this most expensive PHEV version. One of those major things is for interior, you get quilted Napa leather in the Premium Plus Turbo S. You do not get that in the Premium Plus PHEV. Kind of an interesting way that Mazda went about specking out the interior, especially at almost $2,000 more for this Premium Plus PHEV. You'd think you'd get the option to have quilted Napa leather. Unfortunately, you do not get that option. Now moving into the interior of the plug-in hybrid, we do have the red interior, which is one of two available colors, except for tan, but we'll cover that here in just a few minutes. At the very top of this door panel, we're gonna have a soft touch material. Moving down, we have a soft leather material with red stitching, which is gonna match this red insert. There's not much going on in the door as far as buttons or switches, just the standard lock, unlock, and door handles. But we do have quite a bit of storage here below, especially designed for a slightly larger or taller water bottle. Moving up across the dash, we'll find that same red that's going to go all the way across the middle section here, but it will be black above and below. Down in the glove box, we do find a bin style glove box that is big enough for just about everything you might need. Certainly should fit a small tablet or laptop computer. But moving across the front, we don't find a small tablet or laptop computer. What we find is a 12.3 inch infotainment system. And that 12.3 inches is also gonna be what we find for the driver display. Unless you are in the very, very base model at that point, this driver display will move to a seven inch screen. Just below our infotainment screen, we have a button bank that's laid out here in a pretty nice fashion. There are quite a few buttons, but we do have quite a few of the options. As you can see, I have the ventilated seats that are on going right now because it is quite warm, but we also have all of our HVAC controls except for the up and down on the overall temperature. That is two individual switches instead of a toggle switch up and down, auto here on the left, sync here on the right. The passenger will also get that ventilated seating here in this model, but will never get ventilated rear seats, but they are heated as an option. Here around the center console, it's a fairly open layout. At the back, you'll find the dial selector that controls that main screen. Now it is a touch screen when using Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, but everything else is adjusted with that dial and switches. Park and brake here, your auto hold on and off, and a volume knob so it is easy to access and turn down. You will of course have volume controls on the steering wheel, but we'll get there momentarily. Here behind this cubby, you do have two cup holders that are big enough, but not enormous. So if you have a propensity for big gulps, this might not quite make the need. But further up, we do find where my sunglasses currently are, a wireless phone charger. And we did have a little bit of issue with this charger. I put my Galaxy S23 Ultra in here and I got a warning through my phone saying that it was getting too hot. And then when I went and looked, it seemed like it hadn't really been charging at all. We tried it again for about a half hour or so and still did not seem to have added any charge. So it's possible my phone was just the wrong shape and size, but it is something to consider. Although most people I know do prefer to plug their phones in anyway. And especially if using Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, it just makes it a slightly smoother connection. Now here for the gear shifter, it is just a little bit unusual and has caught me off guard a couple times. I'm sure it's something I would get used to very quickly, but you have to dog leg off to the right to get reverse neutral or drive, and then dog leg back over to park. Again, probably just a small adjustment, but up above that we find our drive selector. So we will go ahead and take a look in the main display screen. Right now we have had this in off-road from our most recent excursion, but if we move it up, we have EV, normal or sport. Now EV isn't available because we don't have any battery charge left. We did end up using most of that. For sport, you get a red design. For normal, a pretty standard layout. Not too many colors, just a nice attractive appearance. Then if we move to EV, which we can't at the moment, everything does get a little bit blue. 
and down below in off-road, everything gets a little bit brown. Now the screen layout can also change depending on what driver assist features you're using. If I turn off all of them, this is gonna be a little bit more of a conventional layout. And then on your right, you're able to swap through a couple different display items. Depends on what it is you're looking for. Now, not everything has to be found here on the driver display because we do have a heads up display. It is gonna be hard to see, but it is a color display and you are able to use your Google Maps from Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Moving down to the steering wheel, it's a pretty simple design, basically a three spoke layout. On the left here, you have most of your infotainment controls, volume over here, left, right on your play track, hang up, pick up the phone and your info slider. On the other side, we have more of our driver assist features, our adaptive cruise and our adjustment for how far away we wanna be from the vehicle in front of us, your overall speed setting, steering, as well as your cruise control on and off. Here in the center console, we have a split open and a fairly shallow storage compartment. And that's because this is a rear wheel drive vehicle with an inline six, meaning that the transmission is essentially what's under here. We do have enough room for some of the basics, but if you like having a lot of stuff here in that center console, then you'll have to find another solution if this is the vehicle you choose. Available in most of the powertrains, you'll find a panoramic sunroof. This does a pretty good job of not infringing on the headspace, either front or rear, and it is a nice dual pane opening window. Now I've got the CX-70 out on the road, but the first thing we did is took it off-road to find somewhere a little quieter to get some shots. And I'll tell you what, this is a little bit rough off-road, but it's got plenty of clearance to get us where we needed to go. Yeah, right, it's pretty stiff. They want to go for a sporty feel, but they also give you an off-road drive mode, so it's, it's kind of a balance between the two, right? If you do find yourself off-road, finding a hiking spot, uh, a pond to go fishing, whatever activity you want to do, kayaks on the top, you can get there. It may not be the most comfortable, like a Tyranny Pro, um, Forerunner, or something of that nature, but it has a balance between sportiness and also standard all-wheel drive. For sure. Like I said, it'll get you there. Just You're going to want to go a little slower than maybe some of the other competition. But honestly, that's my preference because most of the time you're in this vehicle or any vehicle, especially as we're stuck behind a truck, yeah. you're going to end up with time on the road. And so I'd prefer that the balance be more towards road handling. And this is really good. Now that we got out behind the truck, one of the things we can really highlight is how well this vehicle handles. Yeah, yeah, on road it handles very well. We're on these nice tight twisty roads out here in the foothills of Palm Springs, California. And honestly, I'm very surprised. I didn't expect these types of roads 20, 30 minutes outside of Palm Springs. Yeah, and the best thing, I think the thing that starts out immediately obvious is how well balanced this is. Now, between the inline sixes or the plug-in hybrid, you're gonna get a 51, 49 weight distribution, either fore or aft, depending on which one you have. We have the slightly rearward balance, but I bet you nine out of 10 or 9.9 .9 out of 10 people would not be able to tell the difference. Yeah, and there's two big bodies in here now, so it might be, it might be 50, 50. We're, we're shifting that balance back up front. <laughs> exactly, put a little bit of weight up front. But yeah, it definitely feels really well balanced, especially for a plug-in hybrid. Now, we drove the, the 3.3 Turbo S yesterday. Mm -hmm. We were not on any twisty roads like this, so we didn't really get to experience what we are in this plug-in hybrid, but I will say that one drove very similar uh, where we can compare. Yeah. So I, I just think that the, the rearward biased all-wheel drive system helps get you through corners and also that kinetic Remind me what that was called again? The connected positioning system, I think, is yep. what it is. But yep. essentially, it's the same technology Miles is using in the MX-5, which is a very different machine. But it helps keep everything really level in the corners. And yep. it, it's confidence-inspiring. It wants you to push it a little bit harder. But it's a nice piece of software that I think goes a long way. Yeah, and what it does is it, it breaks the inside wheel. So let's say we're on a, a nice sweeping right turn. So it's going to break that rear inside tire, so the mm -hmm. rear passenger tire. It just applies the brakes. It kind of hunkers down at that side and prevents a little bit of body roll. It's definitely not eliminating body roll by any means, but yeah. it does help. And when you accelerate, it even does it more. It's it, yeah. ac You actually can. Feel. It reacts to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The other thing that reacts pretty well and differently between the two powertrains we tested is going to be throttle response. So yeah. we only had access to the Turbo S, which is what they call the higher output turbo engine, yeah. and the plug-in hybrid 
off the line, this plug-in hybrid is definitely the one I would go for. It's got so much torque and we do have a turbo engine. It takes just a little bit of time to spool up, but both of them have plenty of power, uh, especially because this has a fairly high tow capacity, um, not versus all the competition, but for a kind of mainstream crossover, the fact that we can do 5,000 pounds in just about every trim, kind of except for the plug-in hybrid, uh, you'll definitely have power to get over the mountain. Uh, I'm very surprised. You know, we're in the most expensive trim as of right now. Mm -hmm. There are a few things, and I'll quickly mention them. That's just my personal opinion. At this price point, and they're trying to like almost dip their toe into that luxury market, mm -hmm. give us lumbar in the passenger seat and give us four-way lumbar in the driver's seat. We do mm -hmm. not get that in this top uh, trim, which mm -hmm. I just think is kind of a miss. And there are a couple other things, design-wise and what is actually in here. I think value for money is exceptional. And it kind of reminds me a little bit, it's different by all means, but it reminds me of what Kia and Hyundai are doing. Mm -hmm. They give you a lot of quality for the money and it's kind of putting pressure on the luxury brands like BMW, Audi, Mercedes. They're kind of getting chased down by a, a, bit, lot, yeah. a lot, lot better value. Now, there's a lot of differences between the vehicles, but you get what I'm saying. You know, it's yeah. like, we're trying to Mazda, Kia, Hyundai, whoever I'm mentioning, they're all trying to take people from those luxury segments right. and kind of get them into a more affordable car, get them better value for their money. And this specific model is brand new to the Mazda lineup. So the question is, who's going to buy it? The hope is that it's not just other Mazda shoppers. The hope is that they're taking some of the competition away. And we looked at a few options and how you want to measure this is going to be a little bit tricky, but we call it a two row SUV. We can build off of that. It has unique powertrains and inline six, which is very European. Very smooth. Yep. And it also has a plug-in hybrid and which you find a lot in the luxury options. Yep. Not a lot of plug-in hybrid in the lower level uh, mainstream competitors. So where you want to find yourself, for my money, this is probably the route that I would lean towards. Maybe not this one specifically. I haven't recently shopped for a mid-size, a large mid-size two-row SUV. Yeah, you personally like small cars, huh? The smaller, the better, in my opinion, but something like this, I could definitely go for it. Yeah. Even though I can feel how big it is, it doesn't drive like it's an enormous vehicle. And for me, that goes a long way as well. Yep. Now, just out of my curiosity, I was not at the CX-90 launch or have yet laid my eyes on a CX-90. Mm -hmm. In the rear cargo area, what is stopping a buyer from just getting a CX-90 that has the third row? Can you, can you fold that away and not use it and get similar cargo space that the CX-70 has? Or what's what's like the differentiating factor between the cargo space in the 90 and the 70? Because yeah, it's, it's in, my, in, in my head, not having seen it, why not just get the three row and then fold it down when you don't need it? And then it's minimal. And I think that's going to be the question a lot of folks have is why not get the three row? If you like some of the styling, because there are some very slight differences across the interior, more black accents than body color or chrome mm -hmm. that you find here. So it does have a little bit of a different vibe to it. And if someone goes to the showroom and they say, Hey, that's cool. They, they would just get it and be happy with it. I would probably look towards something like the CX-90 and say, hey, I've got a third row. When you fold that down, you lose essentially what we have in the back as under storage, that tray layout. Yeah. That's where your seats would go. Yeah. So you're really not missing a whole lot. And it's the same powertrain options, the same two tuned 3.3 inline sixes yep. and the same plug-in hybrid variant. Yeah. So you're really not missing a lot. But yeah. again, if you don't want a third row, if you just you don't need it, then I can see plenty of people going this direction. Yeah. And it also puts it closer to something like a, uh, let's say an RX 350H yeah. or 450H plus, all the plugins or the hybrid variants. Um, because as we may not have mentioned earlier, this, all of them are hybrid, it's just plug-in hybrid or not. The other two inline turbos are mild hybrids, but there's a little bit of a, a transition point as we're going from zero to 20. You can feel where the motor kicks off and the, the engine kicks in and that's not the smoothest but mm -hmm. it's it's great when you come to a stop especially out here where it's 90 some odd degrees a lot of the time this week and yeah. you are at a stop your engine stops but your air conditioning doesn't and i think that's one of the the big benefits there of something like this hybrid system yeah for sure and like you mentioned yeah every every one of these vehicles in the cx70 lineup is hybrid in a way the two inline sixes the way that hybrid system works is it kind of just takes place of a torque converter. Mm -hmm. So the electric motor gets you from like a zero to three miles an hour. And then once the gears can catch up, you're on your way. Sometimes it is a little clunky. Like yesterday we were doing some, some spirited driving, just testing the vehicle out, seeing how it drove, how that inline six feels. 
it wasn't consistent in the launches. It, it like was very dependent on how much brake pressure you had and how much throttle you had when mm -hmm. launching it. Or your drive you mode, it makes a difference yeah, as well. Auto hold on, traction control off, what drive mode. Um, what I do find is in this, it seems a lot more consistent. Yeah, with the plug-in hybrid. Yeah, yeah. Because you get so much of that torque off the line because yeah. that uh, the total output is about a third of the total vehicle output. So yep. while that turbo is spooling up, you're already getting quite a bit of punch. Yep. The one thing I will say uh, that we won't see here, but if we are in EV mode on the highway, we really weren't able to keep up at 70 miles an hour. Yep. In theory, this will go as, as far as you can. It's not like a set mile per hour shutoff, but it was, I think we were fighting the wind, which doesn't help anything. And 70 is not the speed limit everywhere, but trying to stay at 70, it couldn't stay in that EV mode because there just wasn't enough power or there wasn't enough battery left to give it the rest of that juice. So that is something to consider that if you are doing a lot of highway driving and you want this to do that, uh, 60 and 65 is where you're going to want to be to max that out. But around town and a little bit of highway, you'll get that 25 miles of EV range. And then it switches over to 25 MPG, which is the same as the other ones, which I found interesting, but each of them is gonna play a little bit different depending on how you use it on a regular basis. Yep, exactly. And one thing I wanted to touch back on is the handling portion of it weight-wise. Mm -hmm. The plug-in hybrid is just over 5,000 pounds. Is that correct? Yeah, about 5,200 or so. Okay. Yeah, so it's definitely not a light vehicle. It's about four or so, 400, 450 pounds heavier than the other options. Yeah, but it handles it really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're out on these twisty roads, like I said. Coming uphill, handled it really well. Going downhill, we got some traffic, but overall, it doesn't have too much body roll. Obviously, it's a 5,000 pound vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's tall-ish compared to a car. It's gonna have some body roll, but all in all, like it handles it really well. So that's one thing I will say is handling of the CX CX70 is great. It's good, yeah. yeah. This, this has been a great drive, and uh, now I think it's time to go ahead and wrap things up. Yeah. At the end of the day, the CX70 is fun to drive, has plenty of room for passengers and their cargo, ground clearance to get you wherever you probably want to go, and some unique engine offerings that you don't find in a lot of the competition at a similar price point you would normally have to jump quite a bit higher. But that all said, it is a very competitive market for the two row SUV. And I'm not sure exactly who the buyer is for a CX-70, but whoever buys it will probably enjoy it quite a lot. The question remains, and I'm not sure I have an answer, would you get a CX-70 or a CX-90? Let us know down in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any other thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, let us know. We'll get to them as soon as we can. Hope you enjoyed the video and we'll see you in the next one.